أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته As we mentioned last night after completing the pilgrimage Sulaiman alayhi salam, along with his army, they were making their return to Jerusalem. And as you know, it was quite a long journey. And on this journey, there were a number of resting stations. And when they stopped at one of the resting stations, Sulaiman alayhi salam notices that one of the birds in his army is missing. A very important bird, the Hudhud, who according to the traditions, was given the duty of finding water whenever they had settled at a resting station. Now upon discovering the absence of the Hudhud, Sulaiman salam essentially says, you know, where is the hoopoe bird, and he says that this bird will be punished severely or slaughtered for its absence unless it can present an acceptable excuse for its absence. And as I mentioned last night, from these words we understand that Sulaiman salam had established a culture of Discipline. If discipline is expected of birds, you can only imagine the type of discipline that would be expected of human beings in the army of Sulaiman. And this is something that's important for us to reflect upon because sometimes as religious communities, we can be quite undisciplined. You know, aside from maybe the, the Khoja community, most communities, if the majlis is at 7, it means it's at 7.30. We, we, we lack this type of discipline. In the army of Sulaiman, there were expectations. Things needed to be done on time. They needed to be done efficiently. So, as Sulaiman is inquiring about the hoopoe bird, the bird appears and says that I have I've become aware of some information that, you're, you, that you don't know. I've brought, in you, I've brought you certain news from the land of Sheba. Ayah number 23 is the hoodhood explaining what he had discovered to Sulaiman. Ayah number 3, وَإِنِّي وَجَدْتُمْ رَأَةً تَمْلِكُهُمْ وَأُوتِيَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَلَهَا عَرْشٌ عَظِيمٌ He says, I found in the land of Sheba a woman who rules over them. So he mentions a number of things about Bilqis and her empire. You notice the intelligence of this bird. The hoodhood makes it a point to mention that I noticed something that was outside of the norm. I came across an empire that was being ruled by a woman. For, for the hoodhood, this was something that was rare. And even if you look at human history, the overwhelming majority of empires have been patriarchal. It's, it's rare. The norm is patriarchal societies. The exceptions are what? Matriarchal societies. The fact that the hoodhood is able to discern this is, is quite exceptional. وَأُوتِيَتْ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ 
the bird says to Suleiman that this queen has been given every sort of blessing. The land of Sheba is a land of prosperity. They live comfortably. It's a very developed empire. وَلَهَا عَرْشٌ And she also has an immense, a magnificent throne. And then he says, so he mentions three things here. He says, in the land of Sheba, it's a land that is ruled by a woman. It's a matriarchal society. It's a land that is quite prosperous. They have every sort of blessing there. The agriculture, the technology, the security. It's a very advanced civilization. And she has an immense throne. And then he starts to tell Suleiman about the religion of those people. He says, وَجَدْتُهَا وَقَوْمَهَا يَسْجُدُونَ لِلشَّمْسِ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ He says, I found that this woman and her people, they prostrate to the sun. They are a religious community. But they're prostrating not to Allah, they're prostrating to the sun. وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَصَدَّهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ فَهُمْ لَا يَهْتَدُونَ You know, this hoodhood has more understanding than many human beings. Notice how this bird describes the civilization. It says that these are a people who prostrate to the sun. Why do they prostrate to the sun? Because shaitan has made their actions appealing. Now this is really important. Even an animal in the kingdom of Sulaiman has this understanding that people are not inherently bad. The reason why they are like this is because shaitan deceived them. When you say that these people are misguided because shaitan deceived them, you're implying that if it wasn't for the influence of shaitan, they would have been good people. They would have been guided. You know, it's very similar to Ya'qub alayhi salam. When he admonishes his sons, he says that shaitan has misguided you. He doesn't say that you are evil, you are wicked. No, you, have, you are a victim of shaitan. And this is important because this is how we should see people. We should never have this impression that those who follow different religious traditions are evil to the core. There's something inherently wrong with them. No, they're victims. They're victims of their environments. وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَصَدُّهُمْ عَنَ السَّبِيلِ فَهُمْ لَا يَهْتَدُونَ Ayah 27. Qala. Now who is speaking? So now Sulaiman listens to the report given to him. Qala sananduru asadakta am kunta min al kadibin. Sulaiman is given what you and I would call an intelligence report. An intelligence report from his own army. Does he just accept the intelligence at face value? He doesn't. And this is the difference between an empire that is led by a God-fearing man and the other empires of the world today. In 2002 and 2003, intelligence officers told the President of the United States and his cabinet that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Did they verify this information? They took it at face value. They didn't verify. Suleiman is given information and he says, I have to check. I have to verify. Because when you are the leader of an empire, you have to make sure that the information that you are given that is going to drive your decisions and policies, they have to be 
accurate. The information has to be accurate. And Suleiman, he says, we're going to have to look into this. We have to see if you're being honest. We also benefit from this ayah in the sense that according to this ayah, even animals are capable of deception. The fact that Suleiman is saying that we have to see, are you being truthful or are you being dishonest? It shows you that even, even animals have the capacity to be dishonest. So what does Suleiman do? He calls upon his successor, Asif ibn Barkhiyah. And he dictates to him a letter. A letter that he wants to send to the queen of Sheba. And this is very important. A good leader always keeps the lines of communication open. Even if it is with a nation that is the furthest away in terms of their values. There's a direct line of communication. Suleiman is willing to engage, to have a conversation with a polytheistic nation. You know the problem with many of the world leaders today, there is an unwillingness to come and even discuss. Everyone lives in their own silos. And they are influenced by the propaganda that they hear. But they're not actually speaking to the heads of other nations. Ayah number 28, Idhab After he dictates to Asif ibn Barkhiyah the letter, he says to the bird, to the hudhud, Idhab bikitabi hadha fa'alqih ilayhim. Take this letter and drop it off in the land of Sheba. Thumma tawalla anhum. And then, Retreat out of their sight. فَانْظُرْ مَاذَا يَرْجِعُونَ And see what their reaction is to my letter. Ayah number 29. قَالَتْ So the Qur'an kind of fast forwards. And this is the beauty of the Qur'an. The Qur'an gets to the point. The Qur'an doesn't tell us what the date was and how long it took for the letter to arrive. Why? Because it doesn't matter. Don't become so obsessed with useless facts. Who cares? Allah wants, this is not a historic, uh, 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 this is not history. Allah is trying to convey important moral lessons. The letter is received. The hudhud drops the letter in the court of Bilqis. Ayah 29, قَالَتْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأْ إِنِّي أُلْقِيَ إِلَيَّ كِتَابٌ كَرِيمٌ She speaks to her mala'. Her mala, the ministers, the advisors, those who are in her court. And the word mala comes from the verb mala'a, which literally means to fill. And it, usually a king, a queen, they are surrounded. The rooms that they are in are filled with advisors and ministers and aides. So she says to them that I have received a gracious letter. Ayah number 30. Who is the letter from? Innahu min Sulaiman. The letter is from Sulaiman. Wa innahu bismillahir rahmanir rahim. The letter is from Sulaiman. And the letter begins with, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. It begins with a recognition of Allah. It doesn't begin with from Suleiman, the king of kings. No, 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 no. Suleiman is highlighting here that Suleiman is a king, but there is a king above Suleiman that you and I have to be conscious of. And Suleiman is not insecure or embarrassed about his faith. A Muslim leader is to have izzah is to have honor. He doesn't hide his eyes. He's proud of his eyes. So even in his government correspondence, there is a centering of God. And this is what's missing in the world today. A centering of God in the discussion. وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ Sulaiman, what does he say? 
Ayah 31, Allah ta'lu alayya wa atuni muslimin. In the letter, he says, do not be haughty, do not be arrogant. Don't be arrogant with me. And come to me and surrender. Sulaiman, he doesn't say that, okay, you can pay jizya. No, 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 jizya is only for Ahlul Kitab. There's a, there's a policy with every group. He says, you have to surrender. Now you might say, but what happened to religious freedom? See, even if you look at the literature of Ahlul Bayt, even religious freedom has its limits. You know, even in the secular world, there are certain ideologies that are considered dangerous to the human project. There are certain ideologies that are, that are seen as a threat to human prosperity. In 1947, for example, President Truman, he said that the United States is going to use all of its power to stop the spread of communism, even if it means that we have to engage in military conflict. So those who say that, oh, you know, why are... Even in secular societies, there is this understanding that there are some ideas and some ideologies that are dangerous. The problem is, secular people only look at things that are dangerous for the economy. Whereas a prophet of God is looking at those ideologies that are dangerous and that will stifle human development and moral development. And shirk is one of them. Just like there is a zero tolerance policy for terrorism and certain isms, with Sulaiman salam, there is a zero tolerance policy when it comes to ideologies that stifle human growth and human spirituality. And he's unapologetic. He's unapologetic. Ayah 32. قَالَتْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأْ Aftuni fi amri. This is Bilqis. She says to her aides and her advisors, Aftuni fi amri. Give me some advice. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these verses, it seems that there is an implicit praise of Bilqis. You know, she is a consultative leader. And I'll speak a little bit about uh, this in a few moments. قالت يا أيها الملأ أفتوني في أمري ما كنت قاطعة أمرا حتى تشهدون. She says to her advisors, her ministers, that you know that I don't make any decisions without first hearing from you, hearing your point of view, hearing your testimony. I thirty three. Her ministers, advisors, what do they say? نحن أولو قوة وأولو بأس شديد. They tell her that we are a people, we are mighty, we have military power, we have might and unyielding resolve. We are an extremely powerful military. But we recognize that you are the queen, that the final decision is with you. So you decide what should be done. Now listen to this. Ayah 34. قَالَتْ إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا وَجَعَلُوا أَعِزَّةَ أَهْلِهَا أَذِلَّا وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُوا Look at the wisdom of Bilqis. She says, she starts to think about the consequences of a military confrontation. She says, when kings invade cities, they ruin them. And they make its nobles into peasants. And this is what will happen. Bilqis, even though she has a powerful military, she is still thinking about the consequences of war. 
She's thinking about what will happen to her country. And unfortunately, we have very few leaders who are like this. Biden, the Netanyahu's, the Blinkens of the world, they don't think to themselves, what is going to happen? What is the human cost of war? They just give the green light because they don't care what's going to happen to the average human being. What they care about is filling the pockets of defense contractors. Bilqis is thinking about what kind of damage will, will ensue. So what does she do? The Quran tells us she decides not to fight and she also decides not to surrender. So she says, let us not fight because fighting is going to jeopardize our security. But let us not surrender because we will lose our civilization. So what does she do? She chooses a third option. She tries to essentially bribe or appease Suleiman with a gift. Ayah 35, وَإِنِّي مُرْسِلَةٌ إِلَيْهِمْ بِهَدِيَّةٌ I'm going to send a gift, a lavish gift to Sulaiman. Let's see, maybe the gift will keep them away from us. Let's see what the response is. So she sends a delegation to deliver lavish, lavish gifts. So she's in Yemen, she sends a delegation to go to Jerusalem and to deliver lavish gifts to Sulaiman alayhi salam. Ayah 36. Falamma ja'a Sulaiman. When they came to Sulaiman with the gifts, qala atamudduni bimalin fama atani allahu khayrun mimma atakum. Sulaiman says that are you trying to pay a monetary tribute? Are you, trying, are you trying to appease me for rejecting my demand to surrender? He says, essentially I have no need for this tribute because what Allah has given me is better than what Allah has given you. Nonetheless, you undoubtedly exult over the gifts of yours. Now look at, look at a true Muslim leader. There are some Muslim leaders in the world today, they are so desperate to be acknowledged by certain Western powers that if Obama, if Trump, any of them gives them a gift because they have an inferiority complex, that's enough. That's enough for them. Suleiman, he says, you're trying to appease me with gifts? What Allah has given me is better. Meaning what? Suleiman is not just talking about the material possessions. He's saying that Islam, our way of life, our ma'rif of Allah, Islam is superior to anything that you people have. How many Muslim leaders have this, this energy? where they truly are proud of their faith. The majority of them, they have zero self-respect. They'll compromise to appease others, especially nations that they deem to be technologically advanced because they see technological advancement as the ultimate barometer of success. Suleiman says what we have been given is superior. Ayah 37, irj ilayhim. Go back. فَلَنَأْتِيَنَّهُمْ بِجُنُودِ اللَّا قِبَلَ لَهُمْ بِهَا I will assemble an army that they could not withstand. وَلَنُخْرِجَنَّهُمْ مِنْهَا أَذِلَّةً وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ And we will expel them. We're not going to be bribed. We're not going to be appeased. Ayah 38, قَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا الْمَلَأِ 
أيكم يأتيني بعرشها قبل أن يأتوني مسلمين Suleiman says to his advisors, to his court, which one of you can bring me the throne of Bilqis before she arrives? So there was a bit of back and forth. Bilqis sees that there's an escalation, that Suleiman cannot be bribed like any other worldly king. This is a man who has integrity. This is a man who has principles. He's not going to sell out. So Bilqis decides to go with a delegation to Jerusalem. Suleiman says, who can bring me her throne before she arrives? Ayah 39, قَالَ عِفْرِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْجِنِّ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَن تَقُومَ مِنْ مَقَامِكَ One of the jinn said to Suleiman, I can bring the throne of Bilqis before you stand up from your seat. وَإِنِّي عَلَيْهِ لَقَوِيٌّ أَمِينٌ Ayah 40 قَالَ الَّذِي عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ It seems that that was too long for Sulaiman. The jinn says, I can bring it to you before you get up. عَاصِفِ بِنْ بَرْخِيَ Not a, not a jinn. His successor who is described as having some knowledge of the book. He says what? أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ طَرْفُكَ I can bring the throne of Bilqis before you blink. And in an instant, Sulaiman sees the throne of Bilqis. And by the way, if this is the ability of someone who has some knowledge of the book, how about the one who has complete knowledge of the book, like Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi alayhi. صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد فلما رآه مستقرا عنده when Suleiman saw the magnificent throne of Bilqis transported from Yemen in his presence in the blinking of an eye قال هذا من فضل ربي he says, this is from the grace of my Lord. You see, this is what it means when Allah says, Sulaiman was a wab. He was always turning to me. He never became arrogant and said that we are the superpower, we can do this and that. He says, هذا من فضل ربي. ليبلوني. Allah gave me all of these abilities so that he can test me to see أَأَشْكُرُ أَمْ أَكْفُرُ To see if I'm grateful or if I am ungrateful. I have 41. قَالَ نَكِّرُ لَهَا عَرْشَهَا Suleiman says, disguise the throne of Bilqis before she arrives. نَنْظُرْ أَتَهْتَدِي أَمْ تَكُونُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَهْتَدُونَ So that I can see if she recognizes that this is her throne, Sulaiman wants to test the intellect of Bilqis to see, is this a woman who is perceptive? Does she have discernment? You know, sometimes political leaders, they have to do certain things to size up other world leaders to see, who am I dealing with? Am I dealing with someone who's smart? who's rational, who has discernment or not. Ayah 42, فَلَمَّا جَاءَتْ When she arrived in Jerusalem and she entered the palace of Sulaiman, قِيلَ أَهَكَذَا عَرْشُكِ It was said to her, is your throne like this? قَالَتْ كَأَنَّهُ هُوَ She says, it's as if it's my throne. It was altered a little bit, but she was able to discern that even though there were some minor or alterations, that this is my throne. قَالَتْ كَأَنَّهُ هُوَ 
وأوتينا العلم من قبلها وكنا مسلمين She says to Sulaiman that we had already received knowledge about your religion. Meaning before she arrived in Jerusalem, she did her homework. She studied the religion of Sulaiman. And she said that we gained knowledge of your tradition and we became Muslims before arriving here. Now when you reflect, what do you think gave Bilqis the tawfiq of hidayah? You know, there are many people who are presented the truth, but they don't reject. Rasulullah wrote many letters to the neighboring empires. The majority of them rejected. Why do you think Allah guided the heart of Bilqis? Now, of course, we don't have a hadith or an ayah in the Quran to tell us, but we can infer from the Quran that Perhaps Allah guided her because she believed in the sanctity of human life. She was not willing to go to war for her ego. She was cautious. She was prudent. And because she saved millions of lives potentially, because there was that consciousness in her, she was a person of morality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of that goodness in her, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave her the tawfiq of hidayah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if I go to ayah 44, قِيلَ لَهَا دْخُلِ الصَّرْحِ قِيلَ لَهَا It was said to her, اِدْخُلِ الصَّرْحِ It was said to Bilqis, presumably by Sulaiman or his aides, enter my palace, enter the palace. When Bilqis entered the palace of Sulaiman, she lifted her dress because the floor of the palace looked like water. وَكَشَفَتْ عَنْ سَاقَيْهَا She lifted her dress. قَالَ إِنَّهُ صَرْحٌ مُمَرَّدٌ مِنْ قَوَارِي That this is not water, O Bilqis. The floor of my palace is made of polished crystal. قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي Bilqis says, My Lord, I have wronged myself. She's probably thinking to him to herself that if this magnificent kingdom belongs to the servant of Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, what kind of kingdom does the Lord of Sulaiman have? And I submit along with Sulaiman to the Lord of the Worlds. I only have a couple of minutes and I'll conclude. Bilqis joined the fold of Islam, Islam in its general sense, the religion of submission to God. As Sulaiman, as the years went by, Sulaiman salam started to seclude himself. You know, as you get older, you start to really crave moments of solitude. When you're young, you want to be around everybody. When you're young, because you haven't developed your soul, you need others to validate you. But when your soul matures, you start to enjoy the quietness. You start to enjoy being away from the noise, to be alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Sulaiman used to do at the end of his life. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he tells us about the death of Sulaiman. Surah Saba, ayah 14, and this will be the last ayah that we discuss in the next couple of minutes. فَلَمَّا قَضَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَوْتِ Surah 34, ayah 14. And when we decreed death, upon Sulaiman. Everyone has to die. 
no matter how powerful you are. Suleiman, as great as he was, as mighty as he was, as powerful as his army was, Suleiman cannot ward off death. فَلَمَّا قَضَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَوْتِ مَا دَلَّهُمْ عَلَى مَوْتِهِ إِلَّا دَابَّةُ الْأَرْضِ تَأْكُلُ مِنْ سَأَتَهِ Suleiman was standing in his mihrab and he was leaning on his staff. And Malakul al-Mawt took him as he was standing in worship. And this goes to show you that the angel of death comes at the appointed time. You're sleeping, you're standing. Malakul al-Mawt is not going to wait until you finish your salah. If your time has come, it will take you even while, while you are in the middle of your prayer. And he died while he was standing. He was leaning against his staff. And some of the aides would come and they would look in the room of Sulaiman and they would see him standing in his mihrab, not knowing that his soul had left his body. They thought that he's alone. He doesn't want to be disturbed. And the jinn are working and they're constructing. And then Allah says, the only thing that revealed to them that Sulaiman had died was a termite that ate away at his staff until Sulaiman fell. Falamma kharra tabayyanat al jinn. When Sulaiman fell, the jinn realized, Allaw kanu ya'maloon al ghayb. The jinn say, if we only knew the unseen, ma labithu fil adab al muhi. We would not have continued to work this hard. And Allah is highlighting here that don't think jinn know everything. Sometimes we think that jinn are these unstoppable forces. Allah says, even the jinn did not know that Sulaiman was dead. Because knowledge of the unseen is something that I give. I can deprive it from the jinn. I can deprive it from any human being. And I'll end with this final statement from Amir al-Mu'mineen. Where he says, لو أن أحدا يجد إلى البقاء سلما, if there was any human being who could ascend the ladder of eternal life, أو إلى دفع الموت سبيلا, or who could have repelled death, لكان ذلك سليمان بن داود. If anyone in this world could have escaped death, it would have been Sulaiman. Because he was a king and he was a prophet. But even Sulaiman had to leave this world. And ultimately, all of us will have to leave this world. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to thank all of you for attending these lectures. I hope that these discussions sparked your interest in studying the Quran in more depth. As I, I hope I was able to illustrate that. Sometimes we read verses of the Qur'an and we think that we've understood them. But there are so many layers and everything that I presented to you is just the surface level understanding of the Qur'an.